afternoon, good evening, everyone, and welcome to our second episode of Psychosocial Aspects of Thalassemia and Patients' Quality of Life. We have a very esteemed panel of uh, patients, parents, and doctors, clinicians. So I will introduce them and they will take a few minutes to tell us a little bit about themselves. I am your host, Maria Hachidimitriou, a thalassemia patient and board of directors for the Thalassemia International Federation. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna move on to the next topic and it is family dynamics and support systems. So I just want to add to our support systems because some people might just think of it as your parents, your friends, your teachers. I want to add to that support systems, our healthcare practitioners, our doctors, our nurses, our yes. psychosocial therapists, they are our support system as well. And I'm just going to give my experience that I unfortunately had two weeks ago. And my support system, my hematologist now wants to keep me on low hemoglobin. That is disrupting my quality what? of life. Why? He wants to keep me <clears throat> under the guidelines of 9.5 to 10.5. I'm always 10.8 and above 11, 11.3. So I try not to fall underneath 10.5 pre-transfusion because I have osteoporosis as well. I have extramedullary hematopoiesis as well. And now all of a sudden, he is being my hematologist so narrow-minded and saying, nope, you're going to be under 10.5 for two pints of blood. But when I come back, I'm going to be in the nines. But and my bone what, marrow. For what reason, Maria, as, as, as Ward asked you, I mean, what is his rationale behind that? He says he's speaking to European doctors and um, it, it has been proven clinically to suppress the bone marrow. All you have to do is be between 9.5 to 10.5. That's it. And he wants to keep me between this. And I said, but it's not just about suppressing the bone marrow. It is about living a good quality of life. Exactly. So I yes. find myself now at my age after... For uh, 50 years, 49 years of being transfused at that hospital, then I'm going to leave. And my support system now has broken. And I am very unfortunate. I'm sorry. Shocked, distraught. Mm -hmm. I spoke to my therapist as well, my uh, psychosocial therapist, and, and he was very verbally aggressive with words. Mm -hmm. to the point where he says, if you don't do what I say, you're fired as a patient. Where do I go from there? How do I ever trust this person again? Yeah. You say that? And those words were said to me as I'm getting my transfusion. I said, I'm getting my blood transfusion. Just please leave the room. And how do I go back to that? Would you go back to that ward? Or Ahmed? Mm -hmm. Or Dr... No, and no, that for sure not. Uh, I wouldn't give up either. I wouldn't leave the hospital. I would fight that. I would, I would, I don't know. I would counter that research and I would provoke that it's at this point in life, it is should be your decision to decide at what level of comfort you want to be. Do you want to put more energy into your bone marrow, or do you want to put my energy into your day-to-day -day life? This should be your decision to take. It's so, devastating that I have to get to that point, but. Yeah. Yeah. After so many years of being transfused in this hospital, I, I'm just yeah. um, so confused and so distraught. And the way he spoke to me, so disrespectful. I just can't yes. even see him. And uh, I, yeah. it is, it is. And um, I'm now moving to another hospital. I'm waiting to uh, interview a hematologist because the next one I go to, 
I never want this to happen again. Don't do this to my body. Don't do this to my body. I'm not just thalassemia. I'm osteoporosis. Mm -hmm. I'm extramedullary hematopoiesis as well. Mm -hmm. You're not a case study. You're a person. How can he, his job is to help you. How could he fire you as a patient? It's absurd. Yeah. So that's going to be when we think about family dynamics and support system, we're moving into our new topic right now. I want support system to include our healthcare practitioners as well. So who else wants to take this on in giving us really valuable information that we can live every day knowing that we have this and it's not going to be broken. Yeah, it, it, it's really amazing uh, because uh, as Raj said, um, how can you be fired from being a patient in a hospital? <laughs> Like, and please fire me. Make me stop being a patient. <laughs> uh, he could be fired, but you couldn't be fired. Uh, and there are guidelines. The Lassimia International Federation has... Uh, he says that's what he's, that's what he's looking at, and it's 9.5 to 10.5. And I said, we're not cookie cutters. We're not all the same. This is such individualized, like I have osteoporosis, I have extramedullary hematopoiesis, hmm. so I need a higher threshold. Yeah. I, I, I'm shocked, Dr. Avgenia, I'm shocked. Mm -hmm. I am shocked too, I am shocked too, because as Rob said, uh, um, in the end of the day, um, we have to make our choices. And doctors are there to really help us with our choices. I'm faced with a very important choice because uh, I had to stop. I, I was saying before we started the meeting, I had to stop Desferol because of, of uh, the side effects it's having on my vision and my hearing. Mm -hmm. and, and, and my doctors are saying, uh, you shouldn't stop Desferol. But for me, losing my vision is more important than the iron in my liver, which I understand is a very high risk. And it is a very difficult decision to make, but it is my life. And, and I need to be able to live it the way I want to live it. So mm -hmm. I said to my doctor, no, I'm not going to do Desferal anymore. Although I understand that this is a high risk for my life because I prefer to live less years, but to be able to see than to see, to live more years and not be able to see. Mm -hmm. So it is my choice. And uh, how we live is our choice. Yes. But yes. being able to, to go a little bit uh, overall, um, because of what Sasson said also about acceptance, uh, it is a matter of acceptance in, in, in a certain respect that this is what we have. And it was very important for me also to realize at a certain point, I'm not my thalassemia. I'm mm. a player and I have thalassemia. Thank this you. is something I have, mm. all right? Yes. I need to deal with, but this is not the whole of me. Mm -hmm. right? and, and this is very important also for doctors to understand that we're mm -hmm. something more than our disease. So you can't just be looking at our disease. They have to be looking at our whole life if they want to be there as a support system. Wow. Right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and as, as uh, Ward said, that we're not a case study. We're a human being that has mm -hmm. a name and a face. Um, and... Of course, uh, going back to acceptance, I think it is very important how parents deal yes. with the disease and about the stigma and, and talking about it. Mm -hmm. I'm open about it and I'm still open about it in my working environment, in my friends. Uh, at some point, I took it a little too far. I was just too open with everybody and it is not necessary. But the other extreme is that what I, I grew up with is that there were cousins that met in the hospital and the brother and sister had not shared with one another that their children had thalassemia. Oh, because, my goodness. Right, because they were too ashamed. 
Mm-hmm. So that this was what was happening in the 1970s. Uh, and, and we are far away from that. So it is, there is a middle ground between uh, saying it to everybody and just not saying it to anybody. Mm. Uh, and we each need to find our balance. And of course, uh, I think that it is very important to be able to share it with our important others, because this is where we're going to get our support. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, Ahmed, how, how, is it in, how is it in your family circle? Um, I'm, yeah. Just give it a few minutes. Like how, in general, in Saudi Arabia, where you get treated, are children with thalassemia able to talk about uh, thalassemia outside the family circle and also within their their own family circle? So here in Saudi, it's, the disease is very common in such places in the eastern region and in the southern region. Uh, mm. Fortunately, in my region, whereas the west, it's not very common here. Uh, mm. But I, I think the disease, yani, it can be taught because we have a societies that are there in every region. Like we have in the Western region, a uh, society for the disease in the North and the West. Uh, disease, uh, disease societies, which do seminars, webinars uh, for the patient to talk and uh, group chats in the WhatsApp for patient to talk with each other. So... Uh, the, the patient can be talking with uh, ease and doesn't have any problems. But if I can add just uh, to the previous uh, problem, which is blood and uh, transfusion, I think the doctors, uh, when when they have a problem with prescribing two units or three units uh, for hemoglobin to be in the normal range, it can come from the, the doctor not being... Uh, not having the knowledge about the hemoglobin target. Like I have a doctor who is very compassionate and uh, nice, but she doesn't know that a thalassemia patient needs uh, to be on nine free transfusion uh, or 10. Uh, after I told her many times, she, she uh, agreed to let me uh, transfuse at this level. But previously I was uh, on six and seven hemoglobin. Uh, yeah, yeah. These four months, uh, I changed to tr- uh, two uh, weeks regularly. That's uh, increased the hemoglobin to about 8.5 and 9. If I asked for more than that, I, I will be fired. <laughs> oh. You will be fired as a patient. <laughs> yeah. Wow. That's, wow. That's... So, yeah, it comes maybe from, uh, from lack of knowledge from the doctors and nurses. Because some nurses, when they say my hemoglobin is uh, eight, they say it's excellent. Why? Why do you want two units? What do you uh, mean excellent? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I get so mad, but uh, they say, oh, it's eight, because they are adapted to my previous hemoglobin visit, which mm-hmm. is was uh, six or seven. So that's. Rough. I always go back and I say to them. Can I puncture a hole in your body and take out some blood until you fall down to an eight? And then you, you know, you go tell about me your how life. it feels. Yeah. 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 I always go back to that. And they, they can't stand when I say that. <laughs> they get very, very angry. You should. Wow. Wow. Anger is a powerful tool that we should use. Yes, because we could turn, we could turn the anger and, you know, just become, it could become very productive. Mm-hmm. Angry yes. emotions, if we turn it the right way, can be very productive. Mm-hmm. Yes, for mm-hmm. sure. Mm-hmm. And it's a, it's it's a way to counter ignorance because most issues I've seen, I mean, most issues from like support systems, even if it's just professionals or doctors or friends or part of my family, most of the issues that I've had came from ignorance, from not knowing, from not understanding mm-hmm. how it feels, from assuming that that person knows better yeah um and i think that what creates most of the issues in the support system a support system should be there to carry you through what you are not to tell you what mm-hmm. you are not or how you should be treating yes. a condition that you 
is all I know. The, from the moment I realized what consciousness is, I knew I was part thalassemia. This is something I grew with, I lived with. And I think someone you can share that feeling mm -hmm. with me that Whenever I don't I go... want someone to tell me what I'm, how to live my condition. You don't even know the least of it. Mm. Whenever I go to thalassemia conferences and I see parents of little children with thalassemia, I always say to them, the best advice that I could give you is be your child's number one cheerleader. Cheer them all the way. Don't tell them you can't do this because you have thalassemia. You can't run this sport because of your bones. You might break your bones. Let kids be kids. Let them run in the playground. If they get hurt, it's okay. They'll get up. They'll heal. But don't make them feel like they're, don't co over coddle. Mm -hmm. Yes, take care of their necessary treatments, but don't over coddle. And uh, I have to go back to Sasan. Yeah. Um, you, when you first heard Ward have thalassemia, did you feel... I can't share this with anyone and they're going to stigmatize me and they're not going to include Ward in school. And what were those emotions? Yeah, it was a very difficult time for me as a mother because I didn't have the education about thalassemia. I didn't know anything. I didn't know how to deal with the situation. But at the first beginning, uh, I was not open for the situation of my son and my daughter. I just want to give them the protection from the society uh, and uh, to protect them for, from any question. And the most breaking heart question I ever had in my life was word when he asked me, mother, why do I have to transfer blood while my cousins doesn't have and my friends doesn't have? So it was a very big question. Uh, I, From the beginning, I want myself to deal about the thalassemia, to know more about thalassemia, to give the protection to my son and my daughter. And later when I learned, and I educate them as they were small kids, I educate them. I give them the education about the thalassemia and the super ability which they both have they were clever, they were amazing, they have a family, they have friends. We have a lot, a lot of gifts in our life. So later, I became an open woman to talk about thalassemia and my kids and my experience and everything without shame, without thinking about any other people's uh, opinion about thalassemia. Me and my kids, I didn't care because I trust myself. I trust that my kids became strong enough to deal with the life and the life condition. I can add uh, my part of the story to that little yes. description there. And uh, yes, definitely. Uh, I think uh, something that helped me through that uh, was Definitely, the support system my mom provided was astonishing. It was, it was. She found the right time to protect us from our own thoughts and questions, and she found the ability to protect us from society's ignorance as she was teaching us. And by the time we we knew enough about ourselves, about our diseases, we could be. We could choose when to be open to society. I could choose when to be open to my friends because I have enough knowledge to help them overcome their ignorance. And I have that power. And I know that I'm well supported by a loving family. I'm well supported by, even with all the stigmas around. I mean, in the in, in social challenges in Syria were not easy. You were always looked down upon. You were always considered different and even with all of that I had the power to stand up and be like so what because I got that support system and now I have I have a network of people and friends that 
feeds my confidence to be able, you guys, standing here with you, it makes me feel brave enough to stand up and talk to the entire world and say about, this is my story. Just like at times when I thought that this is not the time to share my story, today is. Yeah. So, um, fam, tell me, how is the family dynamics and support systems in Vietnam? Are the parents uh, open to share about their child's thalassemia diagnosis with other members of the family, cousins, brothers, sisters, aunts? How is it like? Um, you know, thalassemia is the uh, blood disease which will cause the damage, the effect to the newborn baby. Uh, so in the first stage of the of this disease, um, family is the um, the 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 most important uh, factor to uh, directly uh, effect to the the newborn baby who damaged with thalassemia. So the in the first stage, parent uh, need to um, improve their knowledge about thalassemia. Uh, but m most parents in our country do not know about thalassemia. They just know that's a uh, blood disease. They don't know anything more about uh, what kind of uh, what kind of mutation called thalassemia, what she what thalassemia exactly is. They just know that's a blood disease. Uh, so their 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 children need to do the blood transfusion. That's all. So uh, that's that's in the next stage, the adolescent and the 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 kid will grow up and become a patient who directly working with the doctor in the hospital and they lack of the knowledge of thalassemia too because their parents lack of knowledge about thalassemia and um uh so that i it is the last program uh, um to um to improve the knowledge of about thalassemia for for the parent in our country, so I think in, we need to to, to do more uh, seminar seminar or um, uh, this uh, program like, like like this to 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 improve their um, uh, the knowledge about thalassemia. I think that's the better. Mm. Thank you. Thank you as well. If, if I can add something more, Maria, uh, yeah, because uh, um, I I had the opportunity to do my my final dissertation on thalassemia mm. and the effect that it has on the family system and the adolescent. Um, and one of the things that because you asked us on uh, that I found was that of course it, it it's to be expected. But anyway, I also found it <laughs> with research that the moment of diagnosis for the parents is a great shock. Yes. And, uh, and a lot of parents uh, experience uh, feelings of uh, depression and sadness mm -hmm. and loss mm -hmm. of the idea of a healthy child that they had in their mind. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it is a very important crisis also for the couple. So one of the things that was obvious was that when uh, the couple was uh, very had very strong bonds before the child was born, they, the diagnosis brought them even closer together. But if there were difficulties in the relationship between mother and father, uh, the diagnosis very often led to a breakdown of the relationship because they started accusing one another, it's your fault, no, it's your fault, and, mm -hmm. and uh, blaming uh, on one another. So uh, one of the suggestions that I had with my research that um, was that it, it is a very important moment for psychological support. Yes. And in, in, in many places, um, hospitals have psychologists helping people with uh, when they receive a serious diagnosis anyway, right? Mm -hmm. Whether this is cancer, diabetes or whatever. So it is also very important very often for the parents to receive this kind of support when they hear a diagnosis for their child. 
because the way they're, go they're going to deal with it and the, whether they're going to be able to accept it and, and sort of incorporate it also in their self-image and in, in, in their life, it's going to, uh, of course, affect the way the child is going to deal with it. Right, um, Dr. Bogusia talked about attachment. So it, it, it's very important. Our early relationships are very important. So how parents deal with it is very important. And in the beginning, they are greatly shocked and, and they have a lot of feelings and sometimes also feelings of guilt because it is a, a disease that is transmitted genetically. So uh, these are all feelings that need to be dealt with in, in the parental system so that they are not going to affect the child. And of course, I, I was doing also in adolescence, which apparently seems to be a very difficult transition because of what you were saying. Because overprotection and this very strong bond that is created between the mother and the, chi the ill child, the thalassemic child, uh, needs in some way to, to give way to a more autonomous kind of life, right? Because the, the child or adolescent needs to take charge of their life. So how this transition is going to happen from being under the wings of the mother to being out in the real world is very important as well. Thank you, everyone. It's been an honor to be the host Thank today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.